the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 4, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. The video goes off and the lights go down and it just gets dark in here. It's unsettling. So like sitting in darkness, unsettling. Living your life in darkness. Tragic, desperate, terrible, hopeless. The interesting thing about this thing, this movement, this church that we're a part of, this kingdom we're a part of, the kingdom of God, is we are a commissioned community. We have a mission that has to do with light and darkness. Jesus told us, right? He said, hey, all authority in heaven has been given to me, so therefore go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I've taught you, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you as you do this to the very end of the age. Then he also came, came and said in, in Acts chapter 1, here's the deal, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, saying that, You'll go and tell people, right, this is what the light has done for me. You don't have to live in darkness. There's an opportunity to become light. This is what we do. Like th- th- this is the thing that sets us apart. There's a lot of other people that get together and, and meet and have groups and, and maybe throw on a, a weekly or a monthly event. And that's great for social gathering. But for us, the different part is we're a commissioned community. We have a mission from God to be the salt and the light of the world. And the way it's supposed to work, right, is that what happens is you're living in darkness and then you realize, wait a second, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right, and then you go and you go, oh my gosh, we got people living in darkness. Sir, do you have a light? Do you have, do you have a light? Could you, could you be a light? Would you like to shine your light? Just go ahead, shine your light in the darkness as well. Wonderful. Do you know anyone who may be living in darkness right now that could possibly, they would like this good news of being a light as well? Is there anybody around here that you might know sitting maybe next to you or a row over, anybody you know? Anyone? Is there anyone? Her, right here, ma'am, ma'am, would you like to be the light? Okay, so you have, what happened is this device here, it has a light within it, and you can turn it on, and then you become, see, now that happens. Is there anyone here that you know that might want to know? These two here, folks, do you guys have the ability to be the light of the world as well? So you just turn it on, that's how it works, right? And then you hold it up, and it dispels the darkness. So what happens, or what's supposed to happen, is this just keeps happening again and again and again and again and again and again. And eventually, everyone who is a human being has the opportunity to become the light of the world. And so join us, if you would, grab your lights, they're in your pocket, and, and, and let's, let's become the light of the world, okay? Now, it's amazing what begins to happen to the atmosphere of the room when we all let our light shine. You you begin to realize, wow, me shining my light is necessary for us to see, for us to live. It, it, It dispels you know, mystery a little bit, and some of the, the scariness of life. I can see to walk, I can see to run, I can see to build relationships because we're letting our light shine. This is 
what our mission looks like. Now, here is the dangerous part, especially for any of us like me that grew up in the church, is we have forgotten what it actually looks like to live in the darkness. And we then begin to question the impact of our light. And we then sometimes create artificial environments in our life that are only, the only light is let in. And it looks like this. Now, many of you just naturally did what everyone in the first service did. When the light came on, what did many of you naturally do? You turned your light off. Why? Because it was no longer necessary. You see, good intentioned, maybe, we come to faith and we're the light of the world and then we go, the world is scary and dirty and dangerous with all of their sinning and they're gonna mess up my kids and it's, I'm scared of the world because that's what Jesus said to do. He said, be scared. <laughs> and so we create these fake artificial worlds of Christendom where we only use Christian plumbers and Christian roofers and Christian music and Christian schools and Christian everything because we've got to keep the world out because it's dirty and dark. And then before you know it, we're like, I guess it's not really necessary for me to let, let, like, let my light shine. Seems like his, that light's doing fine. In fact, here's another thing we do. This drove me nuts when I went to a Christian college is we would compare our light with other lights, right? Like, well, I mean, I can't shine like that guy. I'm just, just one of these guys, right? Or then what we would do, I remember this in Christian college, you wouldn't actually measure yourself to like being like Jesus. You just wanted to be more like Jesus than the soccer team, but not quite as much like Jesus, like the weirdos, <laughs> right? If you didn't grow up in church, you don't get that joke because your brain still functions correctly, right? <laughs> but religion jacks us up. And I told first service and I prayed in second service, I need the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to keep my snark level really low. No sarcasm, low, I need snark light this morning, all right? But I want you to let you know I'm moving into an area, great passion for me. Sometimes when great passion for me and the hypocrisy of religion come together, there's a snark explosion, all right? And we don't want that today. Sorry, I'm Darren Early One. I get to teach here every once in a while. <laughs> how necessary, how necessary is the good news to you? How necessary is it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever Believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But there's even more good news here because God didn't send his son Jesus into the world to condemn it, but to save it through him. That is really good news. And, and, and how necessary is that good news for your life and the lives that your life impacts. I, 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 I've never been accused of being amazingly smart, so I try to make things simple so I can understand them. 
and make them maybe uh, uh, applicable or uh, accessible to a lot of people. So I have a weekly podcast. It comes out every Wednesday. If you've not downloaded or checked it out, please do. It makes me feel better when I spend that time that it actually gets listened to by someone. Uh, just search my name on all the podcast areas, okay? But every podcast, I end with the same three statements. And the reason is, is because I've tried to take the good news, the essence of the gospel, and just break it into three really easy nuggets. And here's what it is. Here's how I translate the good news, is I say this at, every, at the end of every podcast. God... Okay, well, let me set I'm gonna let me set this in the context of this series we've been doing, okay? Because I said this about three weeks ago. Because of what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do, God is for you in your life. He's not against you. The God who created and sustains the whole universe, he is for you. In your life, he is not against you. Here's some more good news. God is near you, not far away. He's near, he's present, he's here. In fact, he actually has, has given us the opportunity to send his spirit to live within us. That's how near God can be. And lastly this, God has created you on purpose in four a purpose. Your life has design, has purpose, has intentionality. There is a mission set out for you to uniquely fulfill. There is so much hope and opportunity and momentum to your life. That is really good news. But I think the lie we begin to believe, especially if we stay in the church too long and insulate ourselves or isolate ourselves from the darkness of the world is, I mean, you know, I don't know the people that are really interested in that anymore. I don't think people are really into Jesus anymore, Darren. I read an article. I watched the news. Church, love, Love, yes. Jesus, no. They're not into it. Think of the past. We've progressed past Jesus. Okay. Well, I disagree. I think the world is, thank God, literally, beginning to progress past empty, hollow religion. But I don't notice that the world is progressing past the light of the world. You see, people have talked about this often, like even Henry David Thoreau. You ever heard of him? He said great things. He said this, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. The mass of humanity lives lives of quiet desperation desperation do you believe that well I don't know Darren I mean I I have all my family's Christians and my uh they're they're all families are Christians and then I just basically do my best to spend time the majority of time with good Christian people and we all have the light of the world and I've not noticed that we're that desperate so I don't know maybe Maybe we, we, we have to, and maybe not all of us, this is maybe just some speaking to me. Maybe we need to intentionally re-inject ourselves back into dark environments to be reminded and inspired about the gift of the good news of Jesus. This week screwed me up. Spent Thursday in jail by choice, I was a visitor, okay, I was a visitor. Saw a couple of you look at me like, mm, about time. <laughs> <laughs> get to be a part of this thing called the Tower Program at Hamilton County Jail, about once a quarter, I get to go in there and spend a half day with uh, some of the guys that uh, are really progressing their way through this program to be able to reenter and have some momentum. And I spent time with five guys on Thursday and they're all getting out in the next two months. So there's just, there was so much hope 
because they could see the finish line. And I tried something new that I haven't done yet. Usually I, I, I do a little bit of a, a take on the spiritual DNA course uh, that I've created that we, that we use here at Mercy Road. But I've developed a new training that I'm, I'm beginning to use out in, in, in corporate development uh, spaces right now. And God's opened up some cool doors for that. And so I thought I'm gonna try this with the, with the, with the guys. And basically it's, it's a pretty intense life mapping exercise where you go through and, and report multiple levels of your life and, it's, and, and then report that back and, and they don't know it, but basically what I'm trying to do is hear their story and then ask the Holy Spirit to give me a prophetic word for their life, to speak a word of, of, of essence and a defining word from God to their life. And um, one guy starts talking, he's 35 years old. I notice on his paper that he doesn't have a lot written. And in my insecurity, I'm telling myself, well, maybe he didn't like this. Maybe he's not into this. Maybe he's gonna reject me, right? You ever notice when you feel like insecure, you make it about yourself? The reality was he starts sharing his story. He says, yeah, I was, uh, was raised here, kind of out in the country. I grew up in a trailer. Both my parents were heroin addicts. I used drugs for the first time at eight years old. I was regularly abusing drugs by 12 years old. I began to sell drugs by 14 years old. One of the most uh, difficult memories for me from my childhood is when my parents tied me to my bed and tried to light me on fire. And I'm, I'm sitting there in the room trying to make sense what I'm hearing. This is a real human being that lives and grew up in our town and this is his life. The reason he didn't have much on his page is because after that, right, then it was basically, I don't know if he graduated high school or not, more drugs, more drugs, jail, 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 I'm 35. And, and I'm like, Lord, I, I need some real help because I, I've not really done this before and I'm kind of trying a new thing and I don't know how to find something redeemable or something that's from you for that story. How do you, what do you say? Well, you're using an eight. Um, this world is a dark, broken place. And I don't remember what the Holy Spirit said to me, but he said, I, something came and it was encouraging. So thank God for that moment. Then Friday, I spent most of the day at Hamilton Heights High School. Been working there for the past four years, three years, something, taking the spiritual DNA workshop, changing the name to the purpose paradigm, removing enough biblical content so the public school will be cool, be cool with it, and taking students through it. I'm going through with the alternative high school students this year at Hamilton Heights getting to know these kids and some of them have some emotional uh, challenges, some of them mental, some of them have just life stuff that has made being a traditional high school student a challenge. One student, there's stuff going on with his family. He already works 40 hours a week trying to help support his family and he's trying to get his degree. Found out last week very sharp student who suffered through sexual assault, basically spun their life around and they're just trying to put the pieces back together. And over the past three weeks, been so encouraged by just starting to see, right, week one, I get it, right? They're looking at me like, who is this spiky here? Dork. I don't know who this guy is. And, and watching them this week as I'm helping them understand the strengths that have been built within how their brain functions and how strong and unique they are. Watching their faces begin to transform like there's actual value 
in me. And I wish in that environment I could go all the way across the finish line and be like, you have value because God created you on purpose and for a person. He sent his son, Jesus. He wants to heal you. He wants to bring you to, like, I can't say all that, but my prayer and my hope is that maybe that, that, that this will get them curious, that this will get them moving. And here's the great thing. You get them on the journey of truth and there's a spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit that's in control of all things. And he'll bring maybe someone else who says, I will let my light shine in your life and they will begin to interact and we'll see salvation and life change come through the life of these students. But none of that happens if the gospel isn't really necessary in your life. And you got to answer that question. Is it necessary for you? Is it essential? Or is it something that was pretty cool you heard about when you were a kid, right? Or is it necessary? as necessary as light and darkness. Plato said it like this, right? He said, necessity is the mother of invention. He also said, our need will be the real creator. Necessity is the mother of invention. When something is necessary, you will become full of imagination and creativity to innovate and create to meet that need. So my take is that the complete lack or, or great deficit of imaginative, innovative approaches to reaching people for the gospel says to me that in the North American church, the gospel is not really necessary. What I love, what I love is that we're seeing some pretty cool flashes of light through many of our outposts, through the Mercy Road family of churches makes me happy to be a part of this community. Because see, what happens to us, if, if we stay in a light environment too long and we turn our light off, is the danger is we begin to think that maybe Jesus doesn't work on adults anymore. And we have some stats that really help us believe that kind of garbage. Like we can go through, through the generations and we say, oh, you know what? The, building, the builder's generation, those born before 1946, 65% of them went to church and had faith. Well, you know what? Then the boomers came in, only 35% of them. Then the busters, right? 15%. The Bridget, Bridger's generation, those born between 77 and 94, only 4% of them are following Jesus or going to church. And then Gen Z, and now Gen whatever it is, XYZ, whatever we've got, right? 44, at least 44% of them consider themselves nuns. Like, not like nuns, right? But like, they don't, they have no affiliation, none. And, and so and we go, you know what? It just, rolls going to hell in a handbasket. Jesus just doesn't work anymore, you know? I mean, I know he helped create the world and, and, and saved everybody from their sins, but this is 2024. We don't, doesn't really work anymore. Then, we, then we, we do other stats. This is one of my favorite ones, right? When we, we do stats and we look at about the age that kids stop making decisions for Jesus. And we say things like, if your kid doesn't come to faith by 13, they never will. So be scared that if your kid doesn't come to faith by 13, they're going to go to hell. And the reason is because Jesus doesn't work on 14-year-olds anymore. That's it. So we're going to focus in 13 and below because after that, iron dome of no salvation. Really? Jesus doesn't work on adults. That, that's the thought. Could it be that when you're in high school or below, we get unbelievably creative on how we communicate the gospel to you. But once you graduate high school, the creativity is zero, 
right? Think about it. We just had announcements this morning talking about camp. Caleb did an amazing job, right? Caleb said the first service, I wish that you were on channel eight because I want you to do the weather before me every night. Is it, it, you, yeah, it's good. It's so good. That would be great. That would be a nightly FaceTime. Caleb, tell me, well, dude, it's going to be 65 and sunny. <laughs> check it out. When you're a kid, hey guys, check it out. What, got an idea for you this summer. Guess what? Whole week, no parents. Uh, you got my attention, right? <laughs> No parents for a week. We're going to go up to this place. There's a lake. We're going to have a zip line, climbing wall. It's going to be amazing. Good food. Cute girls. Okay. It's going to be great. You and your buddies at night, we have bonfires and s'mores. We're going to go on hikes. There's, there's team competitions. It's a, there's a great band there. You want to go? Oh, I forgot to tell you about this. Every afternoon, three hours of free time. Like, you know how stressed you are about school and all your sports and stuff? Every day, three hours, free time. Dude, that sounds awesome. Yeah, we do some Jesus stuff too. But how about all the other stuff? I'm in, right? And we spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to make those things happen. In fact, you know what? We've got people that are so dedicated to that, they'll pay for you to go if you can't afford it. Graduate high school. Try this one on. Hey, man, what's up? No, I'm just chilling. What, uh, what are you doing Sunday? <laughs> like, when on Sunday? Sunday a.m., about 9, about 9 a.m. What are you doing? Hopefully sleeping. <laughs> I wake up early every day. So hopefully I'm sleeping. And then I was going to drink some coffee, then probably mow shower, have my first beer before I watch the game. That's what I usually do on Sundays. Oh, well, got a deal for you. How about you wake up about eight, shower, shave, put on some semi-dressy clothes. Where are we going? Church. Uh, I don't go to church on purpose. Yeah, I know. But I do. And they told me to get creative, so I'm telling you. Hey, got free coffee. I got free coffee at my house. Yeah, but it's at church. Hey, hey, listen, here's the cool part. My church is small enough that when you get there, Everybody that goes all the time will know you're the new guy, right? <laughs> so they will awkwardly stare at you. Then the cool part is this. We've been trying to get like, we're trying to like kind of get, you know, relevant. So we're doing like worship stuff now. Our band's terrible. And the lady that sings and the dude, we have one guy, he's a happy heart. We call him happy heart because he's happy and he loves the Lord, but he can't ever sing. Like he can't sing. And the girl she can't sing either, but here's the deal. It's because it's for the Lord, so it's, it's terrible. But we're going to make it through the, just don't make fun of them. Because it's never on key. The drummer only has one arm. He used to be a deaf leopard, right? So it'll be terrible music for about 20 minutes. And then it'll just be weird. You're not going to get that part. Then the pastor gets up. He's probably going to yell a little bit. He's going to talk about like being washed in the blood. That's different. It's not, no one's going to be murdered, but it's going to be anyway. So we'll do that. It'll go longer than it should go. And dude, is there, is there a free time? Is there free time at all? Like snacks? No, we couldn't afford donuts anymore. We had to get rid of them, right? <laughs> I know the answer to this, but I, I can't bring beer, can I? No, absolutely not. Or margaritas, none of that, right? Like, it, is that not kind of the approach that we mostly have? We come up with every creative way to get a, a teen to know about Jesus and then you become an adult and it's like, do you want to sit in a room with strangers and hear songs you don't know and hear a guy talk for 35 minutes? <laughs> Sunday at nine. No, I don't want to do any of those things. <laughs> oh, well, enjoy hell. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted free time. I just get some free time. <laughs> Last night, these chairs were moved and there was a wrestling ring in the middle of this room. Because there's a lot of people that don't really care about Jesus 
but they dig wrestling. So we have got a guy who found the light of Jesus in his life and said, what do I love? I love wrestling and Jesus. How could I do this? His name's Rich Abbott. He started wrestling theology, right? Last night, he told me just in between services, he had one of the wrestlers share his testimony for the first time last night in the ring, right? Yeah. Because what Rich does is he's gotten creative because the gospel's necessary for Rich. And so is wrestling. And I bet sometimes, I've been friends with Rich for a long time, sometimes Rich isn't sure which one's more necessary, wrestling or Jesus, right? <laughs> but at least they fight it out, right? Most of the time, Jesus suplexes the WD, you know, it's like, what am I saying? Anyway, <laughs> what Rich does is he, he books these wrestlers and he's found a creative, innovative way to let them know the good news. They get the money that he pays them to come in. Then in that, in that envelope, he sends them an encouragement message Okay, that has something to do about Jesus. And one time that he sent that, this guy that was there last night came and said, hey man, I'm a person of faith and what you, what you get put in my car tonight really encouraged me. And Rich goes, okay, wait a second. Uh, we were the light of the world, so this guy needs to join the light of the world. So he said, hey bro, you wanna share your testimony sometime? And the guy was like, yes. And last night he stood up in this ring in this room and shared his testimony of how Jesus changed his life in front of a bunch of wrestling fans, Right? I don't know what it looks like for you, but I know that when it's necessary, it will become innovative and imaginative and risky. Several days later, he returned to Capernaum and the news of his arrival spread quickly through the city. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for a single person more, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher and they couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd. So they dug through the clay roof above his head and lowered the sick man on his stretcher right down in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw how strongly they believed, when Jesus saw how necessary they knew it was that they would get their friend to Jesus, when Jesus saw how their faith became innovation and risk and creativity, Jesus said to, this, to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Hey guys, listen. Our paralyzed guy, we want our friend to walk and we've heard that this Jesus guy heals people. So we have to get him in. Oh, guys, overflow seating. We can't get in. All right. But this is necessary. We will not stop till this happens. It's like breathing for me. I love you. You're my brother. I want you to walk. So what can we do? What can we do? Uh, I used to work on roofs a couple years ago and they're not that hard to take apart. We could probably get up there and dig a hole and like, I don't know, so we get some rope. Listen, here's what we can do. Get him, we'll, we'll tie the, ra- like the, the rope up right on each side of it. Now, Bill, you weigh about 95 pounds. You might drop him, but we're gonna have to, you're gonna really have to buff up and really hold your, your corner but we can lower him down right in there. Wait, wait a second, isn't like taking apart someone's roof, isn't that kind of illegal, right? Like, We didn't ask permission. Yeah, I know, but this is necessary. So how about this? Let's ask forgiveness, (laughs) not permission, all right? Let's try it. Let's go, right? And here they go because it's necessary. What is that for you? If you don't have the answer to it, that's okay. This is where God begins to disciple you into your calling. But let me... Be very clear. Do nothing is not an answer available to someone who is actually following Jesus. I told myself in between services that I would be shorter, quicker through this service than the last. Lied to myself. The band's gonna come up. We're gonna gonna land the plane here. You may say, Darren, you got me. I am in a very insulated environment. I have forgotten that the world is dark or I've distanced myself a little bit from it 
to where when I see its darkness, I condemn it because I think it's stupid and annoying and disgusting. I do that sometimes. It's usually when I'm on Twitter. (laughs) And then certain behaviors that may stir a judgmental spirit in me when those same behaviors have a name like David who I'm staring in the face and hearing some of the behaviors now I have moved, been moved from judgment to heartbreak the third point of the sermon was supposed to be this who you eating with? Who you eating with? If you have influential relationships with people that don't know Jesus, you will eat with them. They will invite you to eat with them. You will share life. If you don't eat with anyone that doesn't know Jesus, chances are you don't have an influential relationship with someone that doesn't know Jesus. That is a problem that would need to be fixed for you to make an impact people that don't know Jesus. We're going to give you a a couple softball pitches to do that again this summer with an event we call Worship on the Water, sponsored by Pub Theology, okay? There's the summer events, okay? There's eight of them. First one's just around the corner on May 15th. If my memory serves me right, I think my yellow rickshaw's the band. I'll be speaking, okay? The Flying Toasters are going to be with us this summer, Fools and Fables, Mark and Bowden, and more. Uh, This will be out on social, but this is a great... Another thing we just create here, innovative way to say, you may have friends that don't want to come to church, but they do like live music and hanging out in the beer garden. Bring them, hang out with them. Um, I really like the third point of the sermon. I'm sorry. I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. Hey, you are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, the ambassadors of God, as if God was using your life to make his appeal to the world. Listen how it says it here in the message paraphrase. This would be the the close, 2 Corinthians 5. You are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. Lord, this is a challenge. um, Because if we're honest, we don't, a lot of reasons we don't tell people about you. I think of a lot of it, God, is that we're afraid. We're just scared that we'll be judged or rejected. And um, that's a really weak excuse for us not to share what I think most of us would say is very necessary in our life. So Father, I pray for all of us that step one would be that we would be so overwhelmed by your love and grace and compassion and hope, God, that it would absolutely destroy our pride. That it would absolutely, the, 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 the overwhelming experience of being loved by you would cast out all fear that we have to speak your name, to witness to what you've done in our life. God, we don't have to know every answer to everything. We just need to know what we've witnessed. This was my life without light, without hope, without love, without forgiveness. This was my life in bitterness and all these different things. And Jesus, right, I'm not perfect, but here's what I've witnessed. And I want to let you know that this kind of life is available. God, give us an overwhelming sense of your love that it would compel us, that it would inspire us, that it would make the gospel so necessary that we would become innovative, imaginative, and find ourselves overwhelmed by the joy of getting to join you on being the light of the world. 
Jesus' name.